Well, thank you guys so much for coming. Uh, I hope you had a wonderful holiday break. And it's great to see you back. Before I forget, I'll be remiss, but remember, we do have our workshop holiday party on, uh, on Friday at noon. So if there's an announcement to win that, we'll be talking about it more. Very easygoing um, uh, pizza, some fun drinks. So if you stop by if you'd like to. That'll be a nice little gathering. Uh, but today, we're very lucky to have uh, a man who needs your introduction, but we'll give one anyway. Bob Kravchuk here from the O'Neill School, full professor over there, who's doing some really interesting work on this book. I was really keen to read more about this. So we'll be hearing about his current book project on uh, elements of a post-Keynesian public finance. So um, feel, feel free to take as much time as you'd like here, Bob, you know, 15, 20, whatever it makes sense for you. All right. And then we'll dig into the proposal from there. Thanks for being okay. here. No, um, it's, it's my pleasure. So. Um, as I was mentioning to a couple of folks just before we got started, um, mm -hmm. this is something that I've been working on for a while, mm -hmm. and I've gotten to the stage now. I've got about five thousand pages of notes. <laughs> oh my gosh! And it's yeah, actually it's, or, it's they're mm -hmm. organically, you know, self-organizing into into two or perhaps even three books. Yep. <laughs> if, if if I decide to write a textbook, mm -hmm. and um, uh, it really emerges from a feeling I've had for quite some time that. We don't really quite address public budgeting and finance the way that the way that, uh, that we mm -hmm. should. I think we're basically in a cul-de-sac. So when we see it in advance, that's fine. That's great. Mm -hmm. So my problems with mainstream public budgeting and finance, it really doesn't treat money as anything but a numeraire. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just something out there that we use. We plug it into budgets and accounting systems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We don't talk about its origins, the nature of money. Uh, the way it emerges out of the interplay between the fiscal and monetary side of governmental um, management. Um, mainstream theory also regards governments as sort of giant households mm. that have to be able to balance their expenditures and their revenues in the long run. Mm. And I really don't find that to be terribly appealing, um, especially if you reject, as I do, the loanable funds doctrine, that the amount of money available for investment is fixed at any point in time by the amount of household and business savings. We have known for decades, if not a couple of hundred years, in the case of the Bank of England, that banks create money as they extend loans. Mm -hmm. And that the job of the central bank is not to control the money supply. In fact, the Bank of England, even the debts, they don't control the money supply. They can't. Yep. They control the, the short-term interest rate. Instead, one of their unspoken, unwritten objectives, and perhaps the primary objective, if you look at their true reaction function, as economists would put it, mm -hmm. is to maintain the stability of the banking system, especially in the face of a government that runs chronic deficits. Mm -hmm. And the way you do that is making as many reserves available to the banks as are necessary in order to have things remain on a, you know, an even keel, right? And if that's the case, then, you know, you, you've got to pursue a little bit further into just what it is that is involved in operational terms. In administrative terms, procedural terms, what it is that governments do as they spend tax and borrow and borrow money. And the picture looks very, very different than the mainstream picture in most macro and certainly most money and banking textbooks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? So we have this um, initial note I've made here, the pedagogical separation of monetary and fiscal policies. It's really not reflected in the operational reality. The U.S. Treasury plays a key role in monetary management, and the Fed pay plays an equally key role in financing federal expenditures. So that if you look at it in very, very close terms, the, this, the independence of the Federal Reserve is actually narrowly confined to short-run interest rate management. It coordinates very closely with the U.S. Treasury um, on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Um, in the management of the almost 10,000 treasury tax and loan accounts that are maintained at commercial banks around the country. Now, why 10,000? Well, they've got them spread along the, around the entire uh, uh, array of federal Fed districts in, in order to help to balance the uh, distribution of reserves and maintain liquidity across the entire uh, economic system. Mm -hmm. And that is in order to minimize the, the, the uh, monetary impact of federal expenditure, primarily. But we'll, we can go into a little bit more detail as we go. Um, Post-Keynesian economics, from my point of view, um, it's one uh, among a, uh, a, an entire array of heterodox schools um, that developed largely in opposition to the to mainstream uh, paradigms. The main features, <coughs> in, in my opinion, are there's a focus on production, employment, and growth as opposed to scarcity and market clearing. 
the occupation is preoccupation of historical time and not logical time. So we're actually looking at things as they actually develop through time. This means that there is an importance attached to the temporal ordering of events, that the economic phenomenon are more emergent than they are um, sort of predictable. This opens the door to the presence of pervasive, irreducible uncertainty. Uncertainty is what gives uh, economic actors their liquidity-seeking behavior, especially when things turn south. Individual and collectives are intendedly rational, but they don't quite come up to the mark. So in a Nikean uh, sense, they are boundedly rational. Um, institutions matter. Now, this has always been a key um, feature of public budgeting and finance, and every experienced budgeter will tell you that that is true, that the process matters in terms of the outcomes. Um, however, it probably it matters in somewhat different terms than they ordinarily presume. It's an insight, but it isn't a science. There's, there's no predictive value associated with it, and it's never actually been subject to a great, a great deal of, of, of testability, except at the highest levels. So um, people like Jürgen von Hagen have looked at the impact of different kinds of presidential systems, political systems, parliamentary systems, um, on budgetary outcomes, um, and, and that's a contribution, certainly. But it doesn't really strike to the heart of the matter in my opinion. Um, there is an insistence in post-Keynesian economics on the non-neutrality of money. They would even reject the notion of monetary you know, money illusion. Now, basically, they're saying, look, you know, we, people don't work to earn Cadillacs. They don't work to be able to visit Balloon Foods. They don't work you know, to be able to afford vacations. They, they, they work for the money. The money provides them with options options to meet an uncertain future. So you've got your plans, but you know your plans are subject to disruption at a moment's notice because the world is characterized by uncertainty. So as a consequence, um, people seek savings. They seek to, to hoard cash. And so sort of in French monetary circuitous terms, you know, what goes out and circulates, all of it doesn't actually return to the corporate sector as demand. Some of it gets siphoned off and hoarded by, by households and firms. Uh, so money actually does matter. Um, and, well, the proof of the pudding is we've had a very, very difficult time using the mainstream macroeconomic models to really understand what occurred in 2008. Because mm -hmm. there really isn't any financial sector, no role for money. Mm -hmm. It treats the entire economy as a giant barter economy, and if money is used, it's used to economize on transactions costs. But this, this monetary economy is a veil behind which lies essentially what is a barter economy. Mixed market economies are presumed having activist interventionist states. And I've added this since I, I actually penned this because I've had some interesting talks with Bob Bish over the last few months. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that my thinking needs now to include an explicit recognition of the polycentric nature of governing institutions, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, especially when one considers fiscal federalism. That becomes extremely important. Good. Okay, so um, much of the theory here that I'm employing is drawn from modern monetary theory, which is actually more of a collection of ideas and it's a coherent body at this point. <laughs> it's been subject to a lot of misunderstanding, misrepresentation, um, and, and, and misquoting actually in, in, in the press uh, by the, the likes of Paul Krugman, Larry Summers, and many others. Um, so either don't understand it or, or perceive it as a threat, and I think it's a little bit of it's a little bit of both. Um, and Albert Werner's old functional finance idea, which basically <coughs> says that the budget deficit or surplus, the fiscal outturn, should be free to go wherever it goes, in response to the government pursuing its legitimate macroeconomic objectives of full employment of resources and labor at stable prices. Mm -hmm that it's actually the budget deficit is residual. And, and anyone who really understands the way that the federal government goes about budgeting, it is a residual. Mm -hmm. Two-thirds of all federal spending is automatic spending mm -hmm. through entitlement programs. If you meet the criteria, mm -hmm. you will receive benefits. Only about a third is subject to the annual appropriations process. Mm -hmm. There is no moral approbation that can be attached to budget deficits. Congress really is, is not actually making a self-conscious choice to run deficits. Mm -hmm. And as we'll see here in the sectoral balances approach, what, what actually is, is the private sector 
deciding for itself if it wants to deficit spend or save. And in the face of a chronic foreign sector deficit, the only other place the money can go, can come from, is, is from the federal government through budget uh, deficits, as we'll see. Um, the focus is on monetarily sovereign governments. Not all governments are monetarily sovereign. This is one of the areas where MMT needs further development. They can't tell you which ones exactly are not monetarily sovereign. They can't tell you which ones are. And generally, it's the Anglo-Saxon <laughs> countries. The UK, New Zealand, the US, Canada, Japan, that's not an Anglo-Saxon country, but they're in the fold. Um, and within the Eurozone, only Germany, the rest having ceded their monetary and fiscal sovereignty over to the, uh, the, uh, the, e, uh, the uh, Eurozone. Um, I have a project right now I'm working on with a graduate student. Uh, we're looking at seeing if we can't characterize monetary sovereignty as sort of a spectrum mm -hmm. and to see whether or not we can classify the countries of the world according to which they are more or less monetarily sovereign. The problem, of course, is that monetary sovereignty is a fundamentally contestable term. So it's got core terms right in the peripheral terms. These can be sacrificed without losing the essence of what it means to be sovereign. However, how much do you give away before the thing isn't sovereign anymore? So there has to be some threshold, and that's sort of what we're looking at. Um, MMT has no clue on this. Um, I was at a presentation with Randall Ray, the leading light of MMT recently, was speaking, and he said there were at least 190 countries in the world that were monetarily sovereign. And I said, well, that's almost all of them. I know that can't be right. Mm. I know that can't be right. Mm. Uh, Bob, I'm being really stupid. Mm -hmm. Why isn't Australia on your list? Uh, that's mm. a good question. Mm -hmm. I could include it. OK, so it's not that there's yeah. something blatantly obvious about Australia no. that I'm supposed to have. No, no, I could include it. OK. Um, interestingly enough here, um, I've gotten into conversations with the, some monetary economists over this, and they said, well, what about reserve requirements? And I said, well, Canada, the UK, Australia, they don't have them. They just don't have reserve requirements for their banks. It would be wise to keep a certain level of reserves on hand, but the US, for some reason, thinks it's really important to have 10% reserves, which, of course, the banks don't have when they lend money. So what the Fed does is if a bank is short reserves, they now they can always go to the to the uh, the federal funds market, which sort of been interfered with recently because now the Fed is paying interest on the excess reserves that have accumulated in the banking sector as a consequence of quantitative easing, and that becomes the effective floor on the federal funds rate, right? But you know, it's it's what they will do in a pinch. You know, it's a, the same thing is actually true. Banks as they make money or the loans to their to their commercial customers. You know, um, you know. As an example, this is probably going to run over 15 minutes, but as an example, Citicorp, um, if they're approached for a $100 million loan, a line of credit that they've extended to, let's say, Procter & Gamble to, I don't know, throw out a new, a new line of Pampers that fits better, works better, or whatever, um, and they need money for advertising, for development, for the, the construction of plants, the acquisition of machinery, the equipment, training employees, hiring employees, etc. But they asked them that for the $100 million, and Citicorp says, you've got it. They don't go back to New York and say, holy crud, we've got to go out now and get $100 million worth of new deposits. Newsflash, banks don't lend their deposits. They can't. Deposits are liabilities of the banks. See, I mean, on the right-hand side of the analogy, as, as a consequence, you know, they can't lend out the liabilities any sooner than you and I can lend out our credit card debt. So basically, they, they write up their assets and their liabilities by the same amount. And city says, you've got, this, you've got this line now, it's in your account. Procter & Gamble starts writing checks on it. So what has the bank essentially done? They have a franchise from the federal government to create money, extending loans to credit-worthy customers whose projects they have blessed. They have a firm belief based upon projections and the track record of the corporation, as well as perhaps their other financial, financial variables, that um, this this project will pay off and they'll have the ability to repay the loan <clears throat> as a consequence. Now they found themselves $10 million short of reserves at the end of the two-week reserve accounting period. What do they do? They turn to the Fed and they say, we're short reserves. And the Fed says, no problem. Here are your $10 million worth of reserves. They do the same thing for the banks when it comes time to purchase federal treasury securities. Here are the reserves you need in order to purchase these securities and put them on your balance sheet. 
So through the back door, the Federal Reserve is always financing federal spending, especially net deficit spending, through the back door. They can't directly place right, Treasury securities with the Fed, but they might as well right, as a consequence. So here we have <coughs> these two sort of pillars of monetary sovereignty, the state theory and the credit theory of money. Essentially, the state theory says that um, all modern fiat credit money is uh, sponsored by states, essentially. And, and the way that they generate demand, not give value to the currency, you need to be careful, some economists make a mistake here. They impose obligations on citizens in the form of taxes and other kinds of obligations, mm -hmm. fees and charges and things. Right? The credit theory money basically says, look, sovereign debt, sovereign currency, pardon me, today basically consists of non-interest bearing government obligations. All money is debt. It's a form of debt. And one person's debt is another person's asset. So one way of looking at this is to think in terms of, of the economy being a web, a very complex, dense web of balance sheet relationships. Assets and liabilities that point at each other across different firms, households, individuals, and government organizations as well. Fiat money is not worthless in the sense that it's not backed by gold or silver or some other precious commodity. It is value owing to the state's promise to redeem it. So in this sense, when you get a bank loan and you want to you know, use some of it for the purpose of the loan and you've got some other expenses, you want to cash some of it at an ATM or go to with the bank teller and draw cash, you're going to get some U.S. government currency. The government has pledged convertibility of the bank's created money into the government's own money at par, dollar for dollar. And, and if that's not all, consider this. 95% plus of all the money in use in this country, and I said in use, not currency in circulation because most money is electronic, but 95% plus of it is created by banks, not by the Treasury, not by the Federal Reserve. I explained this to one of my students in class recently, and, and they, they looked at me with a quizzical look. And said, look, I have questions. Said, yeah. Prof, are you saying that at some level the system is based on a form of deception? Well, I said, bless you. Hold that thought and explore it. It's not exactly deception. <laughs> Alan Greenspan would call it confidence. Mm -hmm. Confidence. Mm -hmm. Right? When confidence breaks down, we have a problem. That's why it was so important in the free fall that we entered in 2008 that, that the Federal Reserve begin pushing those buttons. Now, Ben Bernanke says we spent $35 trillion ending the free fall, and he didn't really mean we spent $35 trillion. All it meant was that the Federal Reserve was guaranteeing the bad debts. It wrapped its sovereign mm -hmm. guarantee around these things so that the banks would be held harmless. A lot of that bad paper is still out there. Some of it's on banks' balance sheets. A lot of it's on the Fed's balance sheet. Mm -hmm. It's non-performing loans. And if modern monetary theorists are correct, it doesn't matter. As, um, oh, what is his first name now? I'm trying to remember. I think it's Dennis Graber, the fellow that wrote Debt the First 5,000 Years. Debt forgiveness, repudiations, bankruptcies have been very, very common over the last 5,000 years. It's actually something that has happened repeatedly. People get into debt, they can't work themselves out, the debt has to be forgiven. In, in this respect, it's just a matter of time before the German and French banks wake up and forgive the majority of the Greek debt, which mm -hmm. cannot be repaid. The economy would have to grow by 10 or 15 percent per year just to pay the interest on the debt outstanding. That's not going to happen. Nobody anticipates that as a consequence. Right? So money and debt are inextricably linked. <laughs> So here's the theoretical core, as I think about extending some of these ideas to public budgeting and finance. We don't make any distinction between hard and soft budget constraints. You know, we talk about it, but in very loose, casual terms, without being really terribly rigorous about it. So people like Rowan McKinnon and, and Janusz Kornai more fully developed this idea that whether a government faces a hard or a soft budget constraint is a function of the conditions of money and credit that it faces. So if a government has a back door to another government or to another source of revenue or another source of financing or a credit guarantee or can shift risk or expenditure to some other party, they have the elements of a soft budget constraint. It becomes increasingly soft the more of these opportunities that you have. 
So an example, I was working in the last couple of years with the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, the, uh, the Financial Control Board, with a, a group of economists at, at SPIA. Uh, I'm sorry, O'Neill. You know? <laughs> We've become Irish now, we're now OSPIA. Do <laughs> <laughs> you think it's about time we put the pub back in public administration? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> now we're talking. Hot and cold in the bush mills in the restrooms. I think that would be an order. I like that. Yeah, Paul O'Neill might approve, actually. I think so. Well, uh, the thing is, uh, Puerto Rico, the, the, they have $125 uh, a billion dollars worth of, of combination of, of debts. $75 billion worth of bonded debt and another $45 billion worth of unfunded pension now. In a nation, an island nation of three million people. Mm. By comparison, the state of Connecticut has three million people. It's the wealthiest state in the country. Mm -hmm. They have a bonded debt of fifteen billion dollars, and they're in a financial crisis. You can imagine the crisis that's facing the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. And every one of those investors wants their money dollar for dollar. But look at the record. Many of them were purchasing that debt when it was still in junk status. You know, my feeling on the matter is, you know, if you walk into the situation with your eyes wide shut, then maybe you ought to take a haircut. It was speculative to begin with. You bought it on the chance that you might get a payoff, and you lost. It's like you're playing the giant roulette table, right? But one of the factions to whom the debt is owed are teachers' pension funds in the Midwest, not in Indiana or I think Kentucky got rid of theirs, but I'm thinking about Wisconsin, Illinois, Minnesota, you know. Um, they're arguing that, you know, but we always thought that there was some kind of an implicit moral guarantee from the U.S. Treasury, which, of course, Trump closed the Treasury window. He says that's not open. It's not going to happen. Right? So that back door, that perception of a back door created in the eyes of the investment public, a very soft budget constraint on the part of the Commonwealth, and they felt free to invest in their debts, which was a foolish thing to do, but, you know, there, there it is. So these things have real meaning. Even the perception of a, of a budget, a soft budget constraint, has a real, has a real impact. An important distinction that is made in this respect are, are between currency units and currency as issuing units and currency using units. So state and local governments would be currency using units. Households and, and firms would be currency using units. Okay. A currency issuing unit, if they are monetarily sovereign, would be U.S. federal government. U.S. federal government has an ultra soft budget constraint. Not only can it issue as much money that it needs at will on anything that it deems necessary to spend on, it also is in possession of the world's most widely accepted international reserve currency, a not inconsiderable advantage. Right? As a consequence, um, there are a lot of dollars outside this country. You know, and I think that, uh, that Chairman Bernanke erred when he began talking very, very loosely about there being a world savings glut that, that you know, the rest of the world was financing the profligate spending on the part of the United States. Um, uh, where else, if you're growing at 10%, and you're, you're the uh, People's Republic of China, you've got enough money to grow faster, but there's a, a certain limit to, to the extent to which a country can absorb new investment and continue to grow without becoming terribly overheated. And they are well beyond that. <clears throat> By some measures, the most levered country in the world. Right? Where else are you going to put your money? If you're holding it in non-interest bearing U.S. currency, you're going to put it in interest bearing U.S. obligations. So they've moved it over very safely into U.S. Treasury securities. And here's something else too that uh, a former undersecretary of the Treasury, um, uh, Frank Newman, has pointed out. It's a very critical observation. That money never left the U.S. banking system. China's export earnings were previously sitting in accounts that had Americans' names on it, and now they're sitting in accounts that have Chinese names on it, but it's still in the U.S. banking system. So what, what benefit is this to the, you know, the, the central bank in Beijing? You know, it's not as though we've been sending boatloads for, full of cash over to, to China. They can pledge this as reserves in order to expand the domestic currency. As a matter of fact, accumulating so many dollars in U.S. banks should provide an indication that, you know, it's a wise investment to expand investment uh, in physical plants in China. Right? 
And when things were really in those go-go years up until the recent past when Trump seems to have pulled the plug on the relationship, um, that's exactly what was occurring, right? But that money has actually never left the U.S. banking system. So the threat of somehow the Chinese, which only hold at this point about $900 billion worth of debt, it's, it's less than a trillion. If we have around $16.5 trillion of debt in the hands of the public, it's, it's a fraction. We're talking about 7 8%. This, this could move a market, but it wouldn't move it that much. And in any case, the U.S. government would simply freeze the Chinese accounts, reassure the rest of the world that we have a military problem with Beijing, we're working it out, but all your money is good. Have a have open bar, have some drinks on us, no problem, right? <laughs> um, so in reality, neither one of us is held captive by the other. We are in a mutually symbiotic relationship. Much of the work of MMT has been descriptive, basically how things work in practice. It's asking us to put on a different thinking cap and look at the world in a somewhat different way. The policy implications, though, are very different than what the mainstream would hold. But before that, I want to make this important caveat. <coughs> Nothing here should be taken as an indication that budgeting, financial management, the appropriations process, and other control and accountability procedures have been negated. Quite to the contrary, you know, when I talked to federal officials about this, they said, nonsense, I work for the Commerce Department and we are under a very hard spending cap. We can't spend. I, I, I know that. I know that. Mm -hmm. right? Congress in its wisdom, if they decide for accountability and control purposes to impose budget caps, mm -hmm. hard budget caps on agencies, always have the ability to do so. Mm -hmm. And they have the, the um, Anti-Deficiency Act of 1906 to back them up. You're criminal liable if you expend in excess of appropriation. Mm -hmm. That much is true. But for the two-thirds of federal spending that is automatic, mm -hmm. right, which, which together with the progressive income tax system performs the two sides of the automatic stabilizing system, this is where we find the expansion and contraction of the federal budget in response to macroeconomic variables taking place. And this is what I wanted to come to here. This is really a terribly important idea. It's very simple. And it, it derives from the same place that Samuelson and Mankiw and others start. Basically, C plus I plus G plus the foreign sector is equal to national income or GDP. Okay, we get that. But you can rearrange here and introduce taxes. And when you do, you get the domestic private balance, the domestic government balance, and the foreign balance. And across all three sectors, that's the universe now, across all three sectors every year, it must sum to zero. That's an accounting identity. It has to be true. As a consequence, if we're running a, a deficit here, oh, where are we? Okay, if we're running a deficit here, and we uh, we decide to begin deleveraging, to accumulating savings, right? To move, just moving in the direction of reducing household debt. Okay. Where's the difference got to come from? This is a residual. This is the tail that's being wagged by a couple of very big dogs. This is the biggest dog in the room. You know, as a consequence, and the rules are flows have to accumulate to stocks, government deficits, some of the private sector assets, and government surpluses, some of the private sector debts. Each and every time in the history of the country that federal, the federal government has attempted to either run a surplus or reduce substantially the government deficit, it has induced a recession. Because according to this, what has to happen is that the government has to take more out of the private sector than it puts back in. And that's a recipe for recession. <clears throat> you know that old adage, you can pull a string, but you can't push a string. That's pulling the string, right? And that's, a, that's an important point that I think needs to, be, needs to be recognized. And it's actually reflected in the government's own time series. <laughs> We are pushing 12.30, just so you know about it. Okay. So I want to make sure we have time for yeah. discussion. Uh, yeah, well, we're going yeah. to end right about Oh, yeah, it's fine. That's fine. Yeah. 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 I've got yeah. additional slides here in case questions. Oh, sure. Well, sure. That's great. Yeah. These are really helpful. So, so um, this, you can see what, what occurs here. If we start at zero, they're mirrors of each other. Mm -hmm. hmm. So one of the implications. Some of the implications are monetarily sovereign governments can't be forced into bankruptcy in their own currency. Hmm. You, 
can always afford to buy anything for sale in your own currency. And if you've got unemployment in the economy, this is an indication that the deficit is too small. The true constraints that governments face, and it's not as though you can spend with reckless abandon, that isn't what MMT holds. It basically says we face the availability of real resources in terms of labor and material resources. And viable investment projects, a function of technology and people's creativity, <coughs> and possibly inflation. Any other constraints are self-imposed, and therefore political in nature, including balanced budgets and balanced budget amendments, the federal debt ceiling and things like that, which, which are opportunities for the political authorities to dispute one another over issues that are, may or may not be related at all to the economics of the federal, of the federal debt. I'm going to basically stop here. The government can never run out of dollars. It can't be forced to the fall. It can't, it doesn't need to miss a, 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 a payment. And it's never subject to the whims of bond vigilantes. This, this particular diagram is further elaborated there. I like, we'll stop here. That's fascinating. Thank you so much. Maybe just going back to that one slide just to kick us off, and we'll start the we'll start the queue. But you know, this the, one here. Yeah, no, I just I was just curious. Are, are there based on that theory that there, there's no there's no real red lines like looking at Japan with 250 whatever plus you know percent in debt? If the U.S. approached something similar, that wouldn't cause a crisis. It sounds like under under this model, like is, would there be any point at which you know we would at least that there, some of the fundamental assumptions here would be called into question? Or Japan's yeah. an interesting, very interesting case. So 250 percent of GDP now. First of all, we've got to stop and actually ask whether or not the proportion of GDP is a useful measure. Uh -huh. yeah. In my yeah. mind, it confuses a stock with a flow. Yeah. GDP yeah. is a flow variable, the debt is a stock variable. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But it's okay. traditional, so okay. let's stick with it. Right? So 250%, most of it is purchased and owned by Japanese citizens. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the first point. The second point. <laughs> Japan sort of oscillates between recession and expansion. It's, it's just, it, it, it's, it's not really growing. And it's, it's, it's really just hanging on. Yeah. Their problem yeah. is demographic. They're going to lose yeah. half their population in the next 50 years. They're not terribly welcoming. The culture is not terribly welcoming of immigrants. And they know they need to do better. But the way they've been able to basically replace a whole, maybe two generations of young people is with yeah. robots. They don't complain, they keep working, they do what they're told, you can put them anywhere in the country, you know, mm -hmm. and, and so that's what they've done. <laughs> so they've basically managed to compete in productivity terms through exports. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah. I actually helped them out this, this year, I bought, I bought a Subaru Forester. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The Foresters are manufactured in Japan, mm -hmm. you know, the mm -hmm. Hellpacks are manufactured here, the Subaru the Foresters come from there, I bought a Forester. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. You know, but every time they start, every time they start thinking things are getting better, they decide well it's time to fiscally consolidate. So they raise taxes and cut spending, and it drives the economy down again. So they oscillate back and forth. They won't quite believe their own experience, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So they're looking at what's going on through the lens of the neoclassical idea that at some point we're going to have to balance this budget. Right. The M and T people look at the situation and they say, why? Cool. Yeah, Mike, please, and I'll do it free, and I'll uh, put you on the queue. Yeah, this is hard to get my mind around. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay, I think that's a mm -hmm. fair, fair comment. Mm -hmm. uh, let me sort of give a, get a couple of reactions. First, I really like the idea that you're you're putting the political government, mm -hmm. political actors, into the economy in a way that mm -hmm. economists tend not to. Uh, you're really integrating them in as a fundamental part of the system, as you say, active and interventionist sort of approach, in that you can't just model the economy without taking into account what the politicians are doing and the goals that they're setting. I like that a lot. On the other hand, you're saying that what the national government does in terms of how much money they print is just kind of a residual effect of what's actually happening in the domestic and the foreign exchanges or whatever markets and exchanges, it's 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 and the debt that, that accumulated from that is the reason why we're able to prosper and 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 
get more productivity and more like that. So it, it sounds like what you're saying that part of the political discourse has been to worry about that debt, mm -hmm. but you think we shouldn't because that's that's sort of the wrong thing that actually debt is not the threat that it's usually seen for a currency issuing country or currency. Mm -hmm. So then what should the government forces, what should the political actors be focused on? And it sounds to me like what you're saying is that there are some real constraints out there mm -hmm. on uh, you were just talking about the real resources that are out there, the viable investment projects and all that stuff. How can we determine what those real constraints are? Is there anything in MMT that tells you there is an underlying reality in the economy uh, that that would set a limit on how much debt you might generate or or how much volatility the system can handle? So where's you know you you've you've sort of taken away the foundation of having government sitting a what sitting apart from the economy and you know mm -hmm. pulling market uh, pulling fiscal and, and monetary levers mm -hmm. to try to mm -hmm. keep the economy you're saying they, they can't do that they're in there they're part of the system and so th what they're doing in terms of debt doesn't really matter but what is it that's really what should be the focus of the political yeah. discourse on this? Mm -hmm. this this I think is where is where um, MMT you know begins to nod in the direction of the post Keynesians so it says look um, we, we know something about the general state of the economy in the long run. It isn't supply constraint, it's demand constraint, mm -hmm. right? The, the, you know, mainstream e economics today looks at you know, supply side kinds of things. So I sat down at the Brookings a year ago with you know, Barry Bosworth and others. We were looking at Simon Johnson, somebody I've known for 25 years, was the chief economist at the at the at the IMF for a while now back at MIT and you know and sort of brainstorming on this and all that the Washington crowd wanted to talk about was they have sustained a supply side shock mm. tantamount to war most of their productive capacity is gone and what's necessary is we need to rebuild and the only way we're going to do this is if we were able to impose austerity now when I hear the term austerity you know, it just makes my mind just real. Because this is simply a, a synonym for unemployment, yeah. right? That's, that's all you're going to do is you're going to impose additional sure. hardships on people. And, and, you know, the question I had was, I said, pardon me, and I don't mean to ask a naive question, because I'm just from Indiana. All <laughs> and we only just got just running water. <laughs> we only just recently got running water and electricity in the houses. But, but you know, so tell me, I, I really want to know, I'm a little confused here. How is throwing people out of work good for you? Mm -hmm. Because I, frankly, I don't get it. But like I said, I'm not from Washington, so maybe you need to enlighten me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was met with dead silence. You know, it, it's as though I asked the question that nobody wanted to have. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of evidence that the economy is chronically demand constrained. You know, and as a consequence, the only agency in, in society that has the wherewithal to be able to increase demand, and generally that means investment spending, is, is, is the government. Now, mm -hmm. I don't have any confidence in the government's ability to pick and choose winners when it comes to investment in private sector activity. But there are ways to be able to get money out into the private sector in a way that would permit entrepreneurs to take advantage of it. Expanded grants programs, uh, incubators uh, for um, I know, startup ventures, there's lots of things that could be attempted that just simply aren't. Mm -hmm. right? And then of course the the mantra of the modern monetary people today is, is a universal job guarantee. Mm -hmm. That there's an awful lot of infrastructure that needs to be right. addressed in this country. Three trillion dollars by some estimates of infrastructure renewal that needs to be addressed. <coughs> Plus, the sea level rise and climate change are going to make it necessary to take a lot of critical infrastructure currently located along the sea coasts. Yep. And all that stuff's going to have to be moved. And it's not just <coughs> seaports, you know, and, and transportation hubs and nuclear power plants and wastewater treatment plants, et cetera, et cetera. Anybody who's driven up and down the East Coast knows that I-95 runs right on the water. That's the main route up and down. How are people in Florida going to get their food? Yeah. Stuff they can't grow there, of course. Yeah. You know, so there's a lot that's going to need to be done. We need to be thinking about that. Yeah. 
Okay, yeah, please don't mind. Yeah, sure. yeah. Thank you, that was really interesting. And I was fascinated to hear about your project with the graduate student, about how you're planning on putting monetary sovereignty along a continuum of a spectrum. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. at one end of the spectrum is the set of countries that you talked about earlier, the US, UK, Japan, and you laid out the list of criteria for how they actually have that monetary sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if perhaps one other criteria that could be added mm -hmm. is the fact that those currencies are also in the special drawing rights of the IMF, the basket, which allows those currencies to be converted and used by other countries as well. So my question is, is that criteria like perhaps a feature of the fact that they have monetary sovereignty? Mm -hmm. Or is that an effect of the fact that they have monetary sovereignty and that those currencies are in that special drawing rights basket? So I was wondering if perhaps yeah. the designation of an international organization stating that these are special drawing rights currencies gives them that monetary sovereignty, or perhaps it works the other way around. Well, you sort of anticipated where we're going with this. All the attributes that I mentioned here, the usual MMT, attributes are basically focused internally on the countries themselves. Um, a little bit about, you know, whether or not their currencies are freely convertible to others, have an open capital account, etc. But it doesn't really reflect how their currencies are used on the international um, markets. Um, you know, so take a country like you know, Switzerland. The Swiss franc is a very strong currency. The Swiss franc, by, by any estimate, ought to be a reserve currency, but it's not. It's not simply because there aren't enough francs in the hands of central banks around the world. So what we have basically are, are you know, we have the U.S. dollar and we have the British pound. Secondarily, the yen. You can uh, you can find these out there. But forty percent of all central bank assets on the planet, and anywhere, are denominated in U.S. dollars. So there are a lot of dollars around. It's a, it's a consequence of the, the role that the U.S. played in the, in the aftermath of the Second World War, mm -hmm. right? And so it, mm -hmm. it's, it's what Giscard de Stein referred to as an exorbitant privilege that the U.S. has. It, it didn't earn, it doesn't really deserve, but there it is, you know? But yes, uh, there has to be more attention paid to the international role that the currencies play and, and just how they are privileged. I think the SDR is, is a great point. It's one that I've only begun to start thinking about, but, but you've, you've thought about it a little bit more than I have even in the last five minutes. Um, but that's, that's going to be key, mm -hmm. you know. Is it enough, though? Is it sufficient? That's one of the, going to be one of the questions. What really makes a currency monetarily sovereign? You know, is, it, is it that, or is it something else? It's, it's hard to know. And certainly the military plays a role. All of the countries that are on that list, by the way, are allies of the United States, in, in which, which we have extended defense uh, uh, alliances. Mm -hmm. Quite for, we, we have bases <laughs> and installations in all of those countries. Mm -hmm. you know? And so there is a very, very close cooperation between us for security purposes as well. We can't overlook that fact. And I've even begun thinking about just what role do the oceans play in separating these countries from possible um, aggressors as well. So I think it, it, it all comes into play. You do have a few yeah. more books, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> Probably. Probably. Uh, Tony? Yep. Um, yeah, I, actually, this is a little bit of a follow-up question to that. So those countries that do meet these different conditions, which seem to be um, multiple conditions, not just mm -hmm. if it's an or. So has there, over time, have there been countries that have transited into this elite group and then out of it? And mm -hmm. relatedly, it seems, and again, I'm naive on this, and this isn't a joke, I actually don't know much about this, but it seems that the countries who are in this exclusive club mm -hmm. want to maintain its exclusivity. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem like they want to actually work to make sure other countries have co uh, sovereign currencies, right? Mm -hmm. Seems like the more, so is this, are we, is this, idea more of kind of like a trend towards a kind of a mono monocentric sovereign currency or a club of that the dominant network or is it something where actually a polycentric system of sovereign currencies would be better for inequality and development globally you know i um it's, it's a it's a really good question mm -hmm. so i was thinking that we were basically becoming more of a club um whether or not it was intentionally created, I don't know. A club, you know, you think of a club generally, it's, it's, it's an organization that has a membership list and there are qualifications to belong and 
you know, you can be voted on and, you know, <laughs> and blackball if somebody doesn't want you in the club. Mm -hmm. and it's kind of, I, don't, I don't think that's at all how this, how this emerged. Um, I think the Russian ruble had some potential. I mean, we would have looked at it maybe 10 or 20 years ago and thought that because Russia is such an energy giant and there's such a global demand for petroleum products around the world today that Russia would have emerged as one of these. But I think um, within two years, the United States is going to be energy independent. Mm -hmm. Fracking has worked. And, and, and the, a byproduct of fracking is, you know, regardless of how you might feel about its effects on the environment, a byproduct of fracking is natural gas. And all expectations are the price of natural gas is going to be driven in the direction of zero. That the cost of natural gas is basically going to be the cost of transporting it along gas pipelines. That for all intents and purposes, you know, energy will become a very freely available good in the US. Um, and we're going to be exporting more of this stuff. The Russians have a thousand times the natural gas reserves that we have, but they haven't developed a new gas field since 1991. As a consequence, they can't get to it. And even if they started the crash program today, it would take them 10 or 15 years to get there. I've been looking at this, and it doesn't look good for them. Because they don't take the long view. They don't make investments. They speculate. Mm -hmm. All the way up to Vladimir Putin, everybody there is looking at the short term. They have very, very steep personal discount rates, in other words. Mm -hmm. you know. As a consequence, they haven't, they haven't got the wherewithal then even to challenge the US. Even though they have more gas, they can't get it. right? This is going to have dire consequences for world energy crisis. The, the Arabian countries, Venezuela, you know, I mean, part of what's going on in Venezuela today is that, is that the, uh, the oil and, and gas revenues aren't what they were. And they socialized the state to the point where people became terribly dependent upon it, never had enough money. As you drive the cost of a barrel of oil below $50, you do serious damage to the Russian state budget. I mean, things just don't look good for them. So there's, there's some serious issues that they're confronting that, that will not permit their currencies. The Chinese yuan, I was thinking this might actually be a competitor, but they would have to abandon their growth model, right? They'd have to freely float the, the yuan on, on, on international markets. To do that, they'd have to relax their currency and capital controls. By some estimates, their currency, and they are a currency manipulator, they, just because Donald Trump said it doesn't mean it isn't true. <laughs> they, they are, you know. Although I, I always I, 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 I read his tweets with a very jaundiced eye. Yeah. But uh, so 35 percent probably they would find that their currency would appreciate by, which would drive the price of everything we buy from them up in this country. So we'd have some inflation for some period of time. The Chinese public would be surprised at just how far their money went in world markets. They would all live better, but they'd have to abandon their growth model and begin to consume. At some point, the pressure will become too great. They're going to have to do this anyway. The people in China are going to want to enjoy the things that they have earned. And they're not going to want to move to enjoy them. They're going to want to stay exactly where they are. So, you know, so the yuan is not a competitor in the long run. Other possibilities, you know, were, you know, France and Germany and Italy, and all, but they've given their currencies up to adopt the euro. They use a foreign currency. This is the reason Greece is in such difficulty. You know, it's... It, they have not given up their budget. None of these countries have, but they've given up their currency rights. Mm -hmm. There isn't a single currency union in the history of the planet that has ever survived that wasn't also a fiscal union. Mm -hmm. So it's a bad design. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. That alone, I mean, I can't tell you, I can't predict when the EU is going to be transformed. It will have to change. It can't stay the way it is. Mm -hmm. But I don't see these countries ceding their fiscal authority over to Brussels anytime soon. So I don't see any real competitors. As I look around the world, I just don't. As a consequence, I think the situation that we're in is going to remain quite so for some period of time, unless we stumble ourselves into a ruinous war and mm -hmm. throw it all away, which you know could happen. It's happened before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. No. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I've sort of got two thoughts. One of which picks up just exactly on this, mm -hmm. which is that if what's crucial in Greenspan's words uh, is not uh, duplicity, but confidence. And if confidence in the working of the political order and confidence in our ecological future, if those things are declining, they can take confidence in the monetary order down with it. Yeah. Which I think is one reason why, you know, the gold bugs will keep 
chattering way, sure. um, imagining that this is something outside of a political order. Um, so is there a way, and then this gets to my follow-up question, um, Anne Pettifor has made a big deal of the way in which because money is created by banks and money create, <coughs> banks create money not for what you would call investment purposes but for speculative purposes. Right? Maybe we don't actually need more pampers. Maybe we need more childcare. But banks aren't creating childcare jobs. They're giving right. the money to Procter & Gamble. Right. So her argument is that instead of banks creating money, <coughs> governments should create money mm -hmm. for the public good, mm -hmm. which goes along with the sort of MMT job guarantee mm -hmm. idea. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm wondering, given how contentious the debate is about the content of public good, mm. if that could work, or if saying we're going to do this isn't going to further undermine confidence in the whole thing, mm. how do we how do we get past that? <laughs> I, I I I don't know. Uh, you know I'm. I, I look at some of the proposals that are being floated uh, as part of the, the presidential campaign uh, and I'm focused primarily right now on the Green New Deal and it's a fascinating idea to change the way we live, work, and get around mm -hmm. all at once in a four-year period of time is a pipe dream. It's going to take a hundred years. It's going to take a lot of generations. The average age of a car on the road today is 17 years. Most people don't know that. Just to change half the vehicles out would take you 17 years. Um, most of the, uh, the homes and the buildings that we have, these are all sunk investments. Nobody's going to want to duplicate them. And we're not going to be able to roll out building materials fast enough. So, you know, photovoltaic walls and, and, and you know, material for roofs and things where you can actually generate electricity from the ambient light and sun and <coughs> store it in batteries. You know, um, the materials we can, we, can, we can work on, but, you know, houses last 50 years. That's a problem. Another problem is the battery technology. You know, uh, Elon Musk, by, he's done some estimates and others have, have confirmed this. He, he has a one million square foot factory making batteries for the Tesla. He says, we need about 10 of those working 24 seven to put out enough batteries to be able to store what we need to run the country for a year. But we also need the capability of being able to collect the solar energy. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, we don't have enough rare earth minerals, right? So this is very interesting. My, my insider, insider information or not, my son-in-law works at SpaceX. And occasionally, Musk comes through, and he goes through the lunch line with a tray like everybody else and sits and talks to employees. Mm -hmm. Tesla is not really about the cars. It's about the batteries. <laughs> SpaceX is not really about going to Mars, but it's about developing the technology to go to Mars, which will permit you to mine asteroids. The average asteroid has a trillion dollars, yes, a trillion dollars worth of rare earth minerals. Yeah. The average. So the notion is being able to mine that stuff and bring it back here to make batteries and create solar collectors in orbit, in space, to be able to beam the energy back in the form of microwaves and store it in batteries. It will take a couple hundred years, but we should be able to get away from fossil fuels altogether. And that's his long-term vision. Everything else is sort of like, you know, he's, the way he got people excited about doing any of it, you know, and he's all in. He's put 100% of his fortune on the line. It's a fascinating idea. Now, mm -hmm. to really pay off, you'd have to invest over 100 years or something. So, <laughs> you know, there's probably no, no real insider trading value to any of this, yeah. you know, at least not for a long, long <laughs> time, right? But. Um, but in the course notion. of that hundred years, I yeah. mean, if current trends in the United States continue mm -hmm. as they are, yeah. the sort of the distributional effects yeah. of like who's going to benefit from <clears throat> this great transformation mm -hmm. along the way, yes, the people who were able to invest will benefit and their pensions will grow and be worth more, and lots of other people are going to see less and less. Mm -hmm. Which makes yeah. me so think there's, there's confidence an interesting, in the political system gets further underlined. It's an interesting point here that we can't we can't really lose sight of, and, and that is yes, all that is true. But when these people do retire and they decide to begin spending down their investment mm -hmm. growth mm -hmm. stake, 
what are they going to buy? Yeah. Who's going to be producing right. anything? Yeah. You know, that's it's a it's it's a fair question. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's only so many places in the world where you can escape to mm -hmm. um, that won't be affected. Mm -hmm. So um, recently, I've been looking at the work of a, an economist. He started in Australia. He's now, I think, at the University of Nottingham. Steve Keen, K E E N. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he's done some interesting simulations, looking at an incre the increasing distribution of income, growing inequality. Mm -hmm. And he has a very nice little. It's a simple model. It's based on Godwin's old growth model from the 1960s, but he's added a couple of terms to it, and he's complexified it. In other words, he, he, he's put in some feedbacks, and then he looks at, you know, it's, it's experiment, right? It's a simulation, repeated trials over an extended period of time with, with, with you know, um, these decay functions, just how quickly inequality climbs and equality decays. And, and each and every time, increasing inequality is associated with economic collapse. Because there's nobody there to buy anything, and the, and, and the people that are that are working are not producing what it is that others mm -hmm. need. It gets to the point where they can't even supply their own needs in the simulations. He says, so this this really should be con a concern for all of us. And yeah. in, in a few minutes, we have left. We have one question sure. from the kind of Zoom session, and then I want to get sure. to Mike as well. So maybe we can take both at the same time. Uh -huh. So this is Brian Burns uh, asking. So uh, Brian's asking, hypothetically, would the rest of the world and the U.S. private sector let the U.S. government act on MMT? Or like Mitterrand in France in the 1980s, would there be overwhelming pressure to revert to a conventional approach? So that's kind of getting back to the role of the private sector here. Like conventional yeah. approach, does does he mean 100% reserve banking, or does he mean a, a gold standard or gold convertibility standard? Because sure I don't think that's, that's coming back. I don't think it's coming back. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. the problem with gold was there wasn't enough of a gold stock to be able to supply the needs um, yeah. as the economy grew. Uh huh. Uh huh. Um, and so it was inevitable that Nixon would have, well, somebody, if it wasn't so, Nixon, would have abandoned the gold yeah. standard. Yeah. 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 Sooner or later. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I might. Yeah. How does cyber currency fit into mm. this? I mean, yeah. if, if it's all a question yeah, of having confidence, confidence in something, can you yeah. develop enough confidence in one mega Facebook currency or something? I, I call the Bitcoin office. the international yeah. drug dealer's currency of choice. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, but yeah, the whole ecosystem is thousands of cryptocurrencies. Right? Yeah, 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 there are there are lots yeah. of them. Yeah. They're, they're really speculative. All of them. And mm -hmm. My my. I don't know. My take on it from an M&T standpoint is mm -hmm. no state, no currency, no lasting value. Yeah. It's, 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 we're talking about pure speculative pursuits. Well, it's interesting that even the Facebook model is tied to U.S. Treasury bonds, though, right? That was the backup, basically, what the historic mm -hmm. value was. So you can't get away, maybe, even in using the charts to get away from it. Um, any uh, okay. any kind of final comments that you'd like to add, uh, Bob, as we wrap up here? Well, you know, I, you're somewhat more receptive uh, of some of these ideas than I thought you might be. Oh, yeah. That's <laughs> really interesting. Frankly, yeah. yeah. Um, it's a more so, optimistic note. <laughs> yeah, so I, I'm, not, I'm not looking to completely rewrite, you know, public finance. What I'm attempting to do is to sort of to, to, to write it and, and put what we know in proper perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, we haven't even talked about the, you know, the implications for fiscal federalism, which are also yeah. terribly important. Mm -hmm. you know. So if there is this agency at the federal level that is able, you know, agency, I mean agency writ small, yeah. you know, the ability to, to generate um, whatever money we need in order to meet the needs at any level of government, then, then why doesn't the federal government expand its grants and bring back general revenue share? I mean, there's a really interesting question there. Absolutely. And of course, you know, you get the problems with fly paper effects and mm -hmm. the T-Bone model and his ideas come into play, and, and then we course have the uh, issue of, of uh, moral hazard. Mm -hmm. If you make a, you know, a blank check available, why are they really going to spend money on things that they actually need or things that they just simply want? Yeah. Yeah. Well, just the beginning of a longer discussion for him. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> sure. So, thank you. Thanks so much again, Bob. We're just fascinating. Thank you for your attention. Hope you all have a great day. Remember the holiday party as well on Friday. I'd love to see you there. Right. Try to stay.